Howdy folks, it's me, Josh. So, for this time, I'm gonna be looking into likely the most dramatic change in American history that only barely never happened. With that being, if Woodrow Wilson had been defeated in the 1916 election. But first, we need to look into the man that nearly made it happen. Charles Evans Hughes was born on April 11th, 1862 in Glens Falls, New York. His father, David Charles Hughes, had immigrated to the U.S. from Wales only seven years prior and became a Baptist preacher before marrying his wife, a woman named Mary Catherine Connolly, with whom he had his only son. The Hughes family moved around several times, first from Glens Falls to Oswego, then to Newark, and then finally to Brooklyn. Charles was an extraordinarily bright kid. Despite being homeschooled for most of his life, he ended up attending one of New York's most prestigious public schools and graduating at only 14 years old. He went to college at Madison University, now Colgate, before transferring to Brown University two years later, where he once again graduated third in his class at the young age of 19. And it was during his time at Brown when he had his first foray into politics, volunteering for Republican James A. Garfield's 1880 campaign for president. He would then go on to attend Columbia Law School, where he then graduated first in his class and passed the New York Bar Exam with the highest score ever awarded by the state. In 1883, Hughes managed to get his first job in law working for a Wall Street law firm called Chamberlain, Carter, and Hornblower. And five years later, in 1888, he would end up marrying the daughter of one of the partners, a woman named Antoinette Carter, with whom he would have four children. Meanwhile, Hughes ended up becoming a partner in the firm himself, with the firm becoming the Carter, Hughes, and Kravath law firm. And so, Hughes managed to find his place in the world as a successful New York lawyer doing his best to fight in the courtroom. For about 17 years. In 1905, the governor of New York, Frank Higgins, was seeing backlash due to corruption in the state utility companies. And so, he decided to put together an investigation in order to see what exactly was going on. And, seeing Hughes' successes in court, he decided that Hughes should lead this investigation. Hughes was reluctant to accept the governor's offer at first, not wanting to go after these giant corporations, but eventually agreed. His investigation proved to be a resounding success, proving that the state gas company, Consolidated Gas, had been engaging in tax evasion and fraudulent bookkeeping, with Hughes drafting and convincing the state legislature to pass legislation regulating utility companies and lowering gas prices. This victory made Hughes insanely popular in New York, as the governor then quickly brought Hughes onto another investigation, this time against life insurance companies. However, while investigating, Hughes found that many journalists and lobbyists were involved in the corruption, which put him in hot water with the Republican establishment. They tried to get Hughes off of the investigation by nominating him for mayor of New York City, but Hughes refused, continuing his investigation, which, once again, proved to be a great success. But this scuffle between Hughes and the Republican establishment would ultimately push Hughes away from the conservative wing of the party, beginning to drift towards Roosevelt's progressive wing. Meanwhile, Hughes' popularity, success, and pushes against corruption would catch the eye of President Theodore Roosevelt himself. At the personal behest of President Roosevelt, Hughes would end up becoming the Republican nominee for Governor of New York, a position Roosevelt himself had held just some years prior. And, in a close race, Hughes would end up winning the 1906 New York gubernatorial election, being elected as the new Governor of New York. During his governorship, Hughes focused on reform and rooting out corruption, seeing great success in his first term. And, all the while, Hughes also took action in the organization of the Baptist Church, helping to create the Northern Baptist Convention in 1907, becoming its first president. By the end of his first two-year term, despite requests from Republican presidential nominee William Howard Taft to be his running mate, Hughes instead ran for and won a second term as governor of New York. However, his second term proved much less successful than his first, and by 1910, Hughes was looking for a way out. 
and an opportunity presented itself when Associate Justice David Brewer died, leaving a vacancy on the Supreme Court with President Taft offering the position to Hughes. Hughes quickly accepted, resigning from the New York governorship, and after being confirmed by the Senate, Hughes would be sworn in as a Supreme Court Justice on October 10, 1910, continuing to push his progressive beliefs on the court. In 1912, after a bitter split between Theodore Roosevelt and Taft, Roosevelt would end up running as a third-party candidate for the Progressive Party, ultimately splitting the Republican vote, allowing for Woodrow Wilson to be elected president. Quickly realizing their mistake, the two of them both realized that, if they hadn't split the vote, Wilson would have been defeated easily, and so they made it their mission to find a man who could mend the divides in the party. Meanwhile, in 1914, war broke out across Europe, which instantly became a major issue for debate across America. While Wilson and the Democrats largely advocated for neutrality in the war, the Republicans were split, with many supporting neutrality and many others wanting to join the war to support Britain. And so, by the time of the 1916 election, the Republicans were looking for a way to mend the divides in their party, ultimately finding their perfect candidate in Charles Evans Hughes. Hughes was once again reluctant, but after winning several state primaries, despite not even wanting to be on the ballot, Taft managed to convince Hughes to run, telling him that he was the only one who could bridge the gap between the conservatives and progressives, also saying, quote, Your opportunity as president to guide the country through the trial bound to come after the war will be as great as Washington's or Lincoln's. You will be equal to it. Strong men will respond to your call because you are yourself so satisfying in strength and in your political courage and patriotism. Hughes easily won the Republican nomination, becoming the first and only sitting Supreme Court justice to be nominated for president by a major party. Hughes quickly resigned from his post and began his campaign. Hughes ran on preparedness for an entry into World War I, contrasting with Wilson's firm stance on neutrality with his widely used phrase, he kept us out of war. And though the Republicans were still the majority party in the US, the divisions between the conservatives and progressives were still a problem, which would ultimately end up leading to major consequences in California. California was very much a progressive state, and their governor, Hiram Johnson, was Roosevelt's running mate for the Progressive Party in 1912. However, Hughes ended up making the mistake of aligning himself with the conservative faction within the state, which lost him a great amount of progressive support. And though Johnson endorsed Hughes, he wouldn't make any actual efforts to support Hughes, seeing Wilson as the more progressive of the two. Come election day, the race was extremely tight, and with Hughes widely being seen as the favorite to win, Wilson, seeing the US entry into World War I as inevitable, began to worry about what a transfer of power would mean during this crucial period. Since presidents at that point were inaugurated in March, that would mean there would be a four-month period in which power would be transferred from the old president to the new one. And if the US joined the war during that period, that could mean a lot of problems. So Wilson came up with a plan in which, if he lost the election, he would appoint Hughes as Secretary of State, which was second in line in the presidential succession, before he and his vice president would resign, making Hughes president months before he would have normally been inaugurated. Election Day ended up coming around, and in one of the closest elections in United States history, Hughes barely lost to Wilson, winning 254 electoral votes to Wilson's 277. The deciding state ended up being California, which, due to Hughes' missteps, he ended up barely losing the state to Wilson by only around 3,800 votes, only 0.38% of the vote. And if Hughes had managed to win the state, he would have defeated Wilson 267 to 264. And because of just how close the race was, it ended up being highly disputed with some of Wilson's margins of victory being insanely small, such as in New Hampshire, which Wilson carried by only 56 votes. Regardless, Wilson ended up being re-inaugurated, and shortly after, on April 7, 1917, the United States would declare war on Germany, officially joining World War I on the side of the Allies. 
U.S. entry into the war would greatly turn the tides of the war in favor of the Allies as Wilson began to lay out his 14 points for peace, which would ultimately, to a large extent, shape the post-war peace. A bit over a year later, on November 11th, 1918, Germany would surrender, signing an armistice opening the way for peace, with Wilson's 14 points completely reshaping Europe and creating the League of Nations. However, back home, in the United States Senate, many would push back against U.S. entry into the League of Nations, and in opposition to Wilson, the Republicans would ultimately end up taking the non-interventionist stance, seeking to keep the U.S. out of foreign entanglements, and ultimately succeed in keeping the U.S. out of the League. Meanwhile, after his election defeat, Hughes returned to his small law firm in New York. He strongly supported going to war in Europe, and after the war, attempted to negotiate with the Senate Republicans for U.S. entry into the League of Nations. As 1920 rolled around, and Wilson's popularity simultaneously tanked, many wanted Hughes to run again for the 1920 election, but after his daughter, Helen, died of tuberculosis that same year, Hughes decided to stay out of the race, with the Republicans instead nominating hardline conservative Senator Warren G. Harding. Harding easily defeated Democrat nominee James Cox and would appoint Hughes as Secretary of State. While serving as Secretary of State, Hughes was given pretty much free reign over U.S. foreign policy, except when it came to the League of Nations. Aside from that, Hughes managed to avoid a naval arms race between the US, UK, and Japan, and guaranteed the territorial integrity of China. Well, that one didn't work out too well. And when Germany faced an economic crisis due to hyperinflation caused by their immense war debts, Hughes set up a committee that would ultimately create the Dawes Plan, giving Germany loans to help support their economy. After Harding died in 1923, Hughes stayed as Secretary of State under Calvin Coolidge before retiring in 1925, once again returning to his private practice. And when William Howard Taft, who had been appointed as Chief Justice in 1921, fell ill and resigned in 1930, Taft personally requested that Hughes succeed him. So, President Hoover would ultimately end up appointing Hughes as Chief Justice, a post that he would hold until 1941, when, due to his wife's declining health, he resigned, living on for a few more years, ultimately passing away on August 27, 1948. But what if that changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, Hughes had managed his campaign in California just a little bit better, and managed to win the state, being elected president? Wilson and his vice president would immediately resign, making way for the incoming Hughes administration to prepare for entry into World War I. The U.S. would probably enter the war around the same time, with the war ending in pretty much the exact same way, but without Wilson's 14 points, the peace would end up looking remarkably different. The 14 points sought to promote national sovereignty for various populations previously under the control of the Central Powers. What this amounted to was a limiting of the Entente's ability to aggressively claim post-war spoils and punish Germany even more severely. And so, without the 14 points, Britain and France would take every measure possible to cripple Germany. Ever since its creation in 1871, the German Empire severely upset the balance of power in Europe. And so, after facing the deadliest war in European history at that point, the Entente found it necessary to restore stability in Europe. So, in order to restabilize Europe, as well as cripple Germany, the Allies would thus push for Germany to be completely dismembered, deconstructing it to the states that made it up. France would re-annex Alsace-Lorraine and would push for an annexation of the Rhineland. Poland still gains independence, not primarily out of the desire to create a Polish nation-state, but to deny additional lands to Germany, taking Austrian Galicia, Posen, Danzig, and Upper Silesia. Austria-Hungary, which was already ripping apart at the seams, would still collapse in much the same way they did in our timeline, but Italy, without Wilson's ideals of self-determination getting in the way, would gain their desired lands in the Adriatic. Turkey ends up facing a similar fate to our timeline, as does Russia, where despite the US giving greater support to the Whites, it wouldn't be enough to save them. Back home, Hughes would have made an effort to revise the Treaty of Versailles in order to allow for US entry into the League. 
But due to Hughes being the one to push the US into the league, the Democrats, in opposition, would likely end up taking the non-interventionist stance as opposed to the Republicans in our timeline. And with the reign of progressivism never being interrupted by the conservative administrations of Harding and Coolidge, it would continue to dominate national politics, and the main political divide of the day ends up becoming between interventionist progressives supporting the Republicans and non-interventionist progressives supporting the Democrats. However, since much of the Democrats' support base was in the South, which largely supported interventionism, this results in a voter realignment with many in the South breaking from the Democrats, either joining the Republicans or starting a movement similar to the Dixiecrats of our timeline, with the Democrat base instead moving to the Midwest, which was a much more populist and non-interventionist region. Due to this shift, the Republicans continued dominating national politics for decades, with the Democrats likely coalescing behind someone along the lines of Charles Lindbergh down the line. And so, the 1920 election would resume the long series of landslide Republican victories, with Hughes easily defeating the Democrats and being re-elected as president. In terms of domestic policy, the Hughes presidency acts as somewhat of a bridge between the Teddy Roosevelt-style progressivism and Taft-style conservatism, continuing to take action against corruption and trusts. As a result of this economic progressivism, the 1920s doesn't see the rapid and fragile economic growth that we saw in our timeline, meaning the Great Depression never happens either. Instead, the US ends up seeing steady growth, just as it had for decades prior. Hughes and the Republicans continued their interventionist policy in order to support U.S. interests abroad as intervention continues in Latin America, particularly in Mexico. In 1924, Hughes doesn't end up seeking re-election, instead supporting another progressive Republican, such as Herbert Hoover, for president, continuing Hughes' policies into the future. And in foreign policy, the U.S. would make it their first goal to contain Japan. Because of the U.S.'s more interventionist policy in their entry into the League of Nations, they're able to successfully prevent Japan from attacking China, threatening force if they tried to pull anything. And so, with Japan kept at bay, the U.S. manages to secure its dominance in the Pacific, ruling largely unchallenged. In Italy, since the Italians were able to get their demands from World War I, fascism likely doesn't end up rising. And though there were economic factors to the rise of fascism, this would probably result in socialism gaining popularity instead. And so, without its initial rise in Italy, and without the Great Depression, fascism never ends up rising throughout Europe. Meanwhile, in Germany, after having recently been one of the most powerful empires in European history, to now being completely dismembered, this would lead the German people to end up extremely bitter at the Entente, fueling pushes for reunification. In Prussia, Kaiser Wilhelm II's son, Crown Prince Wilhelm, might return himself to the throne, attempting to reunify Germany. However, partially due to the Entente sowing division in Germany after the war in order to prevent such a reunification, the southern German states resist, instead becoming closer with France and Austria. And so, knowing they wouldn't be able to defeat France again, Germany never reunites, ultimately returning to the divided and bickering mess it was. With the Germans being put in their place, the West then sets its sights on the Soviet Union. They begin putting economic sanctions on the Soviets before, likely after some incident, they find an excuse to intervene in Russia, toppling the Soviet government, setting up a Western democracy in its place. And so, the world enters a new age. As the West avoids the disaster of the Second World War, the European powers manage to maintain their control over their colonies around the world. However, the US ends up finding itself as the new world superpower, surpassing Great Britain as the dominant power of the world. But as authoritarianism finds itself re-emerging in Russia, though, this new world order ends up threatened, with the US finding itself at a crossroads between returning to their traditional isolationism or continuing on as the new great power. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to stick around for more. And hey, you could also maybe subscribe or something. So that's it for today's video. Well, till next time, see ya.